I'm Helen Dybal, Managing Editor of Electronics Letters, published by the IET. Here at the International Broadcasting Convention, IBC 2011 in Amsterdam, I'm joined by David Wood from the European Broadcasting Union to tell us a bit more about the latest developments in high-definition TV. David, can you tell us a bit more about how 3D HDTV has advanced since last year? Well, I'm glad you asked, Helen, because I've actually brought with me here the next generation of 3D television set, and it's, it's right here. Here it is. You look through here, and you get some really beautiful 3D pictures. No, actually, I'm kidding. This is a 1901 stereograph, but it actually uses many of the same principles. What's happened to 3D TV over the last year is in two directions. First of all, there have been a number of displays produced, 3D displays produced, that don't need glasses. These are glasses-free displays, and uh, they rely on using a, a lenticular or other surface on the front of the television screen so that each eye sees a different picture. This is a very hard thing to do from a physics point of view, so the equipment that we're seeing here is not exactly of the quality that we probably expect of a, of a television, but it's a good start. That's one thing. On the other side, we've seen developments in the way 3D TV is broadcast. We already have a 3D TV broadcasting system and you can watch those pictures today. But what we're working on now is a second generation 3D TV which is called Phase 2 3D TV. And this will have sharper pictures, more definition in the left and right eye image. And importantly, a new concept which is to allow the viewer to adjust himself the 3D depth range of the picture. And to do this, we need to broadcast as well as the two pictures, uh, something called depth maps and so on. But we're very excited about this because we think it will be a great value for the public and for users of 3D TV. But this second generation is still a few years away yet. Here at IBC 2011, there's a demonstration of super high vision. Can you explain a bit more about that? Yes, yeah, super high vision is, in a sense, another way of improving the sense of realism, the experience of watching television. Super high vision is a television system which has much more resolution than high definition television. And there are two variants of it that are being discussed for potential standardization. One has about four times the resolution of a high definition, a good high definition picture today, and the other 16 times the resolution. And these are called UHD TV, ultra high definition one uh, and two. And what's on show here is the higher level, the one which ha has in fact 16 times the resolution of high definition today, which is around about 32 megapixels. And you can compare that with the kind of camera that you buy, and you can see the pictures are really very, very sharp, and they give you a kind of realism as if it was almost 3D. What advancements in technology were needed to enable super high vision to be created? Well, there had to be uh, advances in the potential size of camera sensors, uh, advances in the the size of display that you can make, because if you're showing this kind of picture, you really need a very big display to make use of it, and also in terms of the digital compression technology. The demonstration here uses uh, the latest uh, compression technology from the MPEG group, a AVC, and with all of these things, it's possible to deliver these, this 32 megapixel television system in around about 300 megabits. So it's, it's still pretty large, but it's, <laughs> It's moving forward and, and the experience is really terrific, as I'm sure you've, you've seen here. There are some important technical parameters that need to be decided for ultra-high definition television and that's what the standards discussion is about now. And one of them is how many pictures per second you need with these new ultra-high definition systems. Today uh, in Europe we watch 50 pictures a second and the discussion here is about whether we can move up perhaps to 120 pictures a second for these new high definition or ultra-high definition systems. And there are other issues too about how to make the best colorimetry for the pictures. But it's moving on and we hope to have uh, standards in the next months or, or coming years. What do you think are going to be the main challenges um, with making the, such a system more widely available? Well, of course, uh, it's first of all the very high bit 
bit rates that they need. Here, the tests that are being done, 300 megabits, that contrasts with something like 12 or 14 megabits that a normal broadcast high-definition uh, picture uses today uh, in Europe. Uh, and so you have to find the channel capacity to deliver uh, all of this bit rate. And possibly it's going to be via broadcasting, possibly uh, via internet. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, uh, the, uh, the tests here are being done by a, uh, an academic a collection of academic networks. That's the only way to bring the 300 megabits in from London uh, to Amsterdam. But I guess, um, well, the displays will have to be affordable. And uh, that's going to be the main barrier, I think. And people here are estimating that we'll have to wait probably about 10 years before that's the case. And how will sound systems have to advance to keep up with the enhanced viewing experiences? Yeah, this is, this is a, a very good point because when you're adding all of this extra resolution, extra definition, uh, you have to ask the question, do I need to do something to the sound system as well to make it match the quality of realism in the picture? And uh, today we have sound systems which are essentially two-dimensional, they're on a flat plane, so you can hear what's happening over the left, right, front or back, but you can't hear what's happening uh, in terms of height. So what we have to do is to develop a sound system that adds this additional dimension of height uh, recognition and, and this is called 3D sound. And we have a number of solutions for doing this. They all involve having an awful lot of loudspeakers in your home, so this may be a deterrent. Uh, but uh, basically it's about creating a three-dimensional sound field and of course the research has to be done about how to do that with the minimum number of loudspeakers in the home. Okay, David Wood, thank you very much for talking to us. My pleasure.